Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Virtual Summer School Series, Program Development Through the Lens of Access and Belonging. We're excited to have you joining us today as we wrap up this year's series. I'm Cheryl Newberry, Program and Personnel Development Specialist with Oklahoma State University. Before we dive into our session, I just want to give you some reminders um, that we are using the Zoom Q&A feature today. Uh, instead of the chat, and we want you to post any questions that you have for our presenter in the Q&A, and we will do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible um, at the end of her presentation. Um, I also have two co-facilitators that are assisting with the Q&A and chat today, and that is Tia Gregory with Mississippi State University and Emily Smith from the University of Arkansas. Thank you, ladies, for helping out today. Um, we are going to uh, address the topic today that is entitled Introduction to Culturally Responsive Evaluation Practices. We've addressed throughout the week ways in which we can use different lens to work through the program development process. We've explored ways to address needs assessment, to hear from a broader voice in our communities. We've explored resources to help us with addressing access and belonging. We also considered design, designing programs for accessibility and also how to leverage an asset-based approach in our programming. And today, our presentation is designed to introduce both experienced evaluators and novices to the principles and practices of culturally responsive evaluation. We will explore key questions and practical considerations that arise when designing, implementing, and analyzing evaluations in culturally, uh, in diverse cultural contexts. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today as she is my colleague here in Oklahoma. She came to OSU Extension in 2021 and serves in a split appointment between Extension and Research. Her name is Scarlett Kingsley, and she is the State Specialist for Evaluation with Oklahoma State University Extension. She got her master's degree from the University of California, Davis, in community and regional development. And during her time as an American Evaluation Association graduate diversity fellow, she received extensive training in culturally responsive evaluation, and you may hear that referred to today as CRE practices, and she applied her knowledge of CRE and community development to a variety of contexts, including working with foundations, the UN, tribal groups, and local governments before coming to Oklahoma State University. Scarlett is currently working on a PhD in Social Foundations of Education and Qualitative Inquiry. Thank you, Scarlett, for joining us today. And with that, I will turn the program over to you. Fabulous. Are we all seeing my screen? Okay, great. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, just going to launch into this. So our outline for today, I have a couple of easy grounding slides. Um, we're going to discuss some of the differences between regular evaluation and culturally responsive evaluation, and discuss a little bit what culture means when we say it in a CRE context. And then the bulk of our content today is going to be working through CRE considerations at each phase of the evaluation process. So starting with what is evaluation, the big fancy textbook definition is evaluation is a systematic method for collecting, analyzing, and using information to answer questions about projects, policies, and programs, particularly about their effectiveness and efficiency. So how is CRE different? Um, CRE is a holistic framework that's grounded in centering evaluation in the cultural context in which it takes place. It rejects this idea that evaluation or even research should be culture free, should be non biased, should be neutral, um, because we all bring our own cultural beliefs and values and assumptions to the table when we do an evaluation or when we participate in one. Uh, CRE also recognizes that demographic, sociopolitical, and contextual dimensions fundamentally matter in evaluation because these are things that are all important to us and we don't leave them at the door when we come to do an evaluation. And CRE is inherently relational, so it prioritizes people and their lived experience along with the outcomes of the evaluation. 
if you look at the fancy textbook definition of evaluation, there's a kind of a chronic lack of people in that definition. Uh, so CRE really says, hey, people matter here. Um, so an example kind of putting these side by side, a traditional evaluation question you might ask would be something like, what, is, what was the impact of the program? Putting that into a CRE lens, you might ask it in a way that says something like, in what ways were different participants impacted by the program in different ways? So we're acknowledging that there are different people participating in our programs and that different people receive programs in different ways. So what is the culture in culturally responsive evaluation? At its most base level, culture is our shared experiences, that collective of all the things that make us us. Um, it includes things like language, the ways we communicate, our values, our beliefs, our customs, our worldviews, and our ways of knowing. And applying this to an evaluation context, that includes everything from the way we reach out to people and communicate with them, what we need from them, or how we're going to conduct an evaluation, to what evidence is acceptable uh, when we're trying to come to some conclusion about the world. So some of the significant factors to culture, and these include, but are most certainly not limited to, our race, our ethnicity, our religion, our socioeconomic class. Um, as we saw earlier in the week with a lot of our inclusion stuff, disability or ability, um, and the culture that gets built around that because it fundamentally influences how we're able to engage the world. Our age, our gender, our geography, uh, sexual orientation, and even things like body shape and size, because we live in a culture that's really critical of people's bodies. So that also is a cultural consideration. And culture is complex. It's one of those things, kind of like leadership uh, or community, where we all think we know what it means right up until we have to define it. So some of the things that I hold when I think about culture is that cultures are, it's multiple sim simultaneous identities. So I live and work in Oklahoma, but I'm originally from Nevada. So I hold two geographic contexts when I'm working. Uh, I'm bicultural, so I'm an indigenous woman and a white woman, but I'm white presenting. So those are two multiple identities that I'm navigating at all times. I'm a PhD student and a faculty member at a university. So again, those are two very different cultural contexts that exist simultaneously for me. So in that way, culture is plural. It's not singular. Um, and culture intersects. It doesn't stand alone. So as I sit with you today, I am a bicultural woman who lives in a different place than she was raised in, and I'm still a PhD student. I'm holding all of those things at the same time. And that's because culture is fluid. It's not a fixed thing. Um, culture is also learned. It's dynamic. So it's something that changes. It shifts in context and time. So the things that we believe or the things that we know or the things that are considered acceptable evidence in an evaluation context might be really different today than they were 10 years ago or 40 years ago. Those things might be different for me in Oklahoma than they would be for some of my colleagues on the call today in Arkansas. But all of this comes together and to ultimately mean that culture is not neutral and power attaches to culture. So in all the things when we're thinking CRE, we want to be aware of the fact that dominant cultural perspectives, regardless of what that is, holds power. Okay, so why does CRE matter? Like I said, people are central to the core of evaluation. The person or people who are requesting an evaluation heavily influence the direction of that. Uh, people who are benefiting from an evaluation, people who might be hurt from an evaluation, who conducts an evaluation. Um, evaluators and evaluation teams have culture that they bring to the table. We also do not separate ourselves from that. And who participates in our programs and in our evaluations. So if we believe that culture is what makes us who we are, we also can't be separated from it, which means the evaluation process isn't separate from it. And I would be doing CRE a disservice if I didn't acknowledge that CRE fundamentally has an agenda. So CRE is a framework that's rooted in social justice and advocacy, and it pulls a lot from racial decolonizing and indigenous frameworks. So that agenda for CRE is in all ways trying to make evaluation push for equity, better social justice, and recognition and valuing of humans in the evaluation process. And CRE fundamentally believes that society is formed and maintained on structural inequality. And as we're moving in a social direction where division based on identity lines is becoming more pressing in our day-to-day -day lives, it's even more important that we're able to stretch ourselves and think intersectionally and recognize that those identities and those cultures are really important to the way we live our lives. So I wanna stop there and just make sure I don't have anything lingering in the Q&A 
for our grounding slides. Thanks so much, think? Scarlett. We don't have anything yet, but I'll let you know. I just uh, reminded folks to post throughout, um, but nothing in the Q&A currently. Fab. Okay. Then I'm going to assume that means that we're kind of on okay ground with the differences between evaluation and CRE and, and how we're using culture in this context. So this is the evaluation cycle, um, and culturally responsive considerations are not an add-on to the evaluation process. There's something that factors into every phase of the evaluation. And some of you, the 62% uh, of you who say you have some evaluation experience, you might be looking at this going, oh, no, wait, I don't do all of that. I just do a survey. I just do easy evaluations. But I think even if you're doing a survey for your programs, you're still figuring out, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to do a survey. Who's going to help me? Who's going to disseminate it? Uh, who should be involved? Who should I talk to? Who's taking my survey? What do I need to know? You're writing questions, you're collecting that data, you're analyzing it, and you're sharing out the findings. So even if you're like, oh, I don't do all of that, you probably do, even in a reduced context. And thus, I think what we're going to talk about is going to be useful for no matter the level or complexity of evaluation we're doing. Okay, so like I said, we're going to work through these nine phases and talk about cultural considerations and questions and some examples at each phase. So phase one, as we're preparing for the evaluation, in this phase, we're really paying attention to detail, we're listening, and we're collecting a lot of basic information on things like history, uh, formal and informal power relations, the values that might be at play in the context, communication styles and languages that are going to influence how we're going to conduct the evaluation, and we're stopping and taking that time to ask, is the evaluator or the evaluation team aware of their own cultural values, assumptions, biases? So um, some of the questions that we might ask here would be, what is the history of the community, of the organization, of the program? What is their history with evaluation? Um, what dimensions of culture are important to consider? So you want to start mapping out those things where you're like, oh, this is a group we've not worked with before. This is an indigenous group or even extension has a really strong culture that I have to be very aware of as I do my work. Um, and how is power held and exercised? Whose values are elevated and whose are marginalized? I'll give you an example later on of a time where I was not aware of power relations in my evaluation practice and it led to a really terrible evaluation result. Um, and cultural consider or practical considerations. Will you need a cultural insider to help guide this evaluation or would having a cultural insider make the evaluation easier or better? Um, so I call my county educators all the time, just informally pick up the phone. This doesn't have to be a whole big thing, but I consistently say, hey, can I pick your brain on this? Or I'm thinking of writing it this way or would this work? Would people respond to this? How would this be received? Um, Part of why I'm doing that is because, so this idea of the history of evaluation, when I started in this role, I didn't realize that my county educators had been asked for evaluations for the previous two or three years that they'd been doing performance appraisals. So when I stepped into this role, there was a lot of demand and a lot of hostility towards the evaluation specialist because they'd been getting, where's your evaluations, where's your evaluations for years with no support. So I thought I was kind of coming into a blank slate, and I most certainly wasn't with the history of evaluation. And that's kind of peppered everything that I've done since I've been in this role. Um, other practical considerations we might think about, do we have language fluency? Do we have the language fluency we need to reach everybody that we're trying to reach? And do we have the technical expertise we need to be carrying out these particular pieces of the evaluation? In phase two, this is where you want to start mapping out all of your partners and interested parties. Um, I'm being really intentional with my language here uh, as a cultural evaluation consideration. A lot of times you would see this be teamed um, engaged stakeholders, but stakeholders is a word that, you know, can be kind of damaging for people who have a history of colonialization. So I'm explicitly changing that to partners and interested parties. So you want to take time in phase two to map out all of the potential partners, participants, and interested parties in your evaluation. And this is where you can start thinking about, like, do we have issues of trust? Where are we thinking about power? Who's being impacted and in what ways by the evaluation? So some of the questions we might ask at this phase, uh, who are the partners and what is their relationship to the evaluation? So a funder who's requesting an evaluation or an evaluation participant or just somebody who um, would be interested in the results, but they didn't participate in your program. Those are all kind of different levels of partnership. 
uh, how can or should participants be involved in the process? And thinking critically about are we missing any perspectives? It's entirely possible that you're missing perspectives in evaluation process, not because you're intentionally excluding people, but because you can't reach those people or they've never participated in the program. There's a lot of different ways to end up not having people participate that's not necessarily intentionally damaging, but it's important that we're aware of like who's at the table and who's missing. And then some of your practical considerations would be things like, are there protocols to enter this community or this context? Or what's the best way to communicate? Is there an order that you should engage partners in? Because this reflects both formal and informal hierarchies. Um, so if you wanted to like evaluate a classroom program, you wouldn't immediately walk into the classroom and start talking to the youth. You would maybe start with the teacher. You might send out permission slips to participate in the evaluation to their parents before you even sort of speak to the youth. And that reflects an order that you would go about engaging that community. Um, similarly, like you wouldn't walk into an indigenous community and just start asking people questions on the street, right? You'd maybe want to start with tribal elders. Uh, how is respect communicated? How is trust established? These things can all be really different depending on the cultural context. I funnel all kinds of stuff from my job through people at different levels of extension because I may or may not have trust with a group coming from the state level. Okay. Um, so when I do partner mapping, I like to think about it as kind of throwing a rock into a pond and then thinking about various groups of partners as the ripples. Um, so if you imagine the rock is your programming, then who's the group that's most touched by your programming and like continuing to think about those who are maybe further from the actual programming itself, but still engaged in having some kind of impact. Uh, like, for example, I have a friend who works for a nonprofit that helps artists of color create art uh, towards the goal of social change. And her organization was only doing their evaluation with the actual artists themselves. But if you think about their mission, their mission is that they get this artistic message to the general public, then that, that thus creates social change and different opinions about people's lives and, and people of color. So to leave out the people who are consuming the art and the impact on them is kind of fundamentally not figuring out whether the reach is actually happening. So she needed to move one step outside of the ripple to try to think about impact. And you can Google like partner mapping tools. There's a bunch of easy diagrams online that can help with this. It doesn't have to be a whole big process. Okay. Um, so in phase three, we wanna start thinking critically about the purposes of the evaluation because evaluation is again, fundamentally shaped by the intended use and purpose of the results. Okay. So the further we get into the evaluation process, the more our practical considerations are going to rise to the top because we're moving from kind of theorizing into doing. So some practical considerations at this level is being really intentional about understanding what the purpose of the evaluation is. If an evaluation is a condition of funding, then that funder probably has some idea or at least some suggestions or restrictions on how you should be conducting the evaluation. Similarly, if you're doing an evaluation to gain knowledge about program planning or development, or if you're trying to inform the future restructuring or downsizing of a program, um, maybe you're doing this because a program's under concern. We're not sure if it's performing well. We're not sure if it's a good use of time or money. Um, or you might just have an ongoing effort towards program reflection and improvement. And an evaluation can serve multiple purposes. It doesn't have to be an either or situation, but, these are all very different ways that you might go about doing an evaluation, different data you might collect, different questions you might ask. So it's important that we're kind of holding what is the purpose of that evaluation. Um, so some questions you would ask at this point is like who benefits from this process and who's burdened? In all of my practices, I try to think really critically about what is the burden I'm placing on people to help me with that process, to give me data, and is there any direct benefit to them? Or am I just asking them to contribute to give me their time, their energy, their feedback for no direct benefit? Um, and again, who's requesting that evaluation? And sometimes is there a political context to the request? Um, especially a lot of the stuff that we're seeing like at the state level in Oklahoma, there might be requests to uh, evaluate educational programs that are explicitly looking for certain kinds of evidence uh, to make you know, critical or potentially harmful decisions about education in the state. Okay, so just to kind of recap, 
uh, phases one through three, when you get through these first three phases, you should know what cultural considerations will be important to your evaluation. Uh, some idea of that context and that history and those power relations that might be at play. You should have an idea of who should be involved, why and to what extent, and who might be missing from your evaluation. And you should understand why are we doing an evaluation now and what purpose will it serve? Okay, so in phase four, this is where we wanna start framing our evaluation questions. And our evaluation questions are not our data collection questions. They are the questions that we're seeking to answer or the thing that we're trying to understand with the evaluation. Um, so evaluation questions set the parameters of what will be examined and what will fall outside of the scope of the evaluation. Thus, they're pretty important. So at this place, we're thinking through things from a cultural perspective of like whose values and interests are represented in the proposed questions. Uh, will the evaluation focus on unintended consequences of program processes and outcomes? This can be really important if we're doing work with marginalized communities. Um, how are questions limiting what can be learned and would different questions expand or change our understanding of the program? So I'll give you an example here. Uh, I was asked to evaluate our online learning modules. We have an instructional designer who builds online learning content both internally for our educators and our state specialists, and then externally for our communities. And I was asked to evaluate the effectiveness of those courses for the people who'd taken them. Okay, pretty standard evaluation question. But zooming out a little bit, I wanted to take a look at all of our educators and see what percentage of them were even using those courses in the first place. Turns out it's a little under 50%, closer to 39 or 40%. So 50 to 60% of our educators aren't using those educational tools for their intended purpose, and the, most, the vast majority of them weren't even aware of them. Um, so then the evaluation questions for that project shifted to how effective are the courses for those who are using them? And what are the barriers to those who are not using them, right? And you can see how that's a very different evaluation. It's a very different set of questions and it tells us different things because I changed overall the evaluation questions I was approaching and it helped shape our understanding of the program. Um, and then similarly, are we operating in a deficit framework? And so this idea of a deficit, deficit framework was introduced to me at my first evaluation job. Uh, I was working for a charitable foundation and I was evaluating the effectiveness of their granting programs on grantees. And one of the pieces of feedback, one of the very few pieces of honest feedback I got uh, in that role was that the foundation always approaches people and says, well, what does your community not have? What are your challenges? Where are you struggling? Tell us all of the ways that you don't have things so that we can fill that need. And they felt hurt because they'd been working with the foundation for many years, but they'd never been asked, what are the strengths of your community? Where are you having success? How are you building on that success? And how can we help you build on that success? And it may not seem like a big deal, but for a lot of marginalized communities, it's very easy for us to pathologize or problematize things without actually focusing on like community strengths or like cultural strengths or capitals. So kind of being aware of, are we building an evaluation that is existing in a deficit framework. Okay, so phase five, we're moving then from our questions into the design of our evaluation. Our evaluation design specifies what information is needed to answer the questions we just wrote and how we're going to get that information. So our practical considerations here will be things like how will participants be protected during data collection, i.e. thinking through those power relations. Uh, will we consider or use non-traditional sources of information and are those respected by the people who are requesting the evaluation? What methods are most appropriate for not only the question that we're trying to ask, but the analysis that we want to do? Uh, I see a lot of people who attempt to use methodology, but then don't have any expertise in actually analyzing the data that comes out of that methodology. So we want to be sure that we're not just picking methods that are culturally responsive, but that we also have the expertise to analyze. Um, and are these methods appropriate in the cultural context? And what is the pace timing of collecting this information? Do we need to maybe slow down? Do we need to build trust? Uh, so I work with Cheryl on a lot of internal programming, like our onboarding and our leadership academies. And in, I think, November, uh, I'm going to evaluate the end of a six-month leadership academy. But I'm going to our leadership academy meetings now to, one, observe, uh, because I get a lot of data off of observation, but also to just be present. So that when I show up at the end of the program, the people who've been participating aren't like, hi, who are you? We've never met you before and we don't know you and we don't know 
if we can trust you. Um, and this worked really well. I actually called an educator for something the other day and we got on Zoom and she went, hey, weren't you at the Leadership Academy meeting? And it's like, yes, I did not speak to this educator, but just my face and being present made me a known quantity, which makes it a lot easier to get data out of people. Um, yeah, similarly, like I, I, one of my specialties is arts-based methodologies, uh, which are really fun and they can be really great for different literacy levels, for different age levels. Um, they can be really impactful for communities that lean more towards like storytelling approaches as opposed to straight up survey methodology, but they can sometimes be a hard sell because if you're doing a science project or if you're doing something with a funder that's like, what do you mean you're going to draw pictures? That's not valid science. Um, so are these non-traditional ways of going about things, will that be accepted? And how are you going to package that if it's something that's important to you? Okay, so phase six, uh, at this point, we're going to select or design our data tools. Uh, so you may be doing an evaluation where you're using a pre-existing validated tool, or you might be setting out to design your own. But either way, your tools should be culturally responsive. So some of our practical considerations for tools would be things like literacy level, language proficiency, and common language or understanding of the participants that are going to be using these tools. Um, I get a lot of surveys that get matched, marched through my office by faculty and um, state specialists at the university level. They use a lot of acronyms or like technical jargon, and I have to constantly be asking, is this something that will, be make, that will make sense? Or is this language that is used by the people you plan to give this survey to? Uh, is oral or written communication more culturally appropriate? Again, some communities, they may have low literacy or they may just be story from a storytelling culture. And is nonverbal communication important? Uh, a lot of times when we think nonverbal, we tend to think body language, but it can also be things like when I come into a community, if I'm coming from Oklahoma State University, for a lot of people that name carries cachet, it's a door opener. But we're also a land grant university, and that can be a painful history for some communities. So I have to be aware of like what coming in and saying, hi, I'm Scarlett from OSU. What does that mean? And what does that communicate to other people before they even talk to me? Um, if you're doing an existing tool or a new tool, you should be thinking about things like the history and evidence that supports that tool, uh, who was involved in creating or validating it, and being aware of the fact that forward translation of a tool, so if you take something that ex already exists and you're like, we're just going to translate it into Spanish, you may linguistically get the right words, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they make sense or that they're appropriate for the cultural context. So again, thinking back to, can we have somebody review this who actually understands this culture, or understands this language? Um, I'll give you guys an example here. I was working with a tribal group that was doing um, culturally relevant, like culturally grounded sexual education for teens and youth in the community. And we were on a federal grant, so the feds decided to hand down the data collection tool that we would use. And our tribe decided that they wanted to actually start working with youth and try to teach them about like body respect and bodily autonomy before they even started having sex. So we were working with sixth graders, but every other organization in the funding group was working with high schoolers. So the tool that I got from the feds was asking some very graphic and detailed questions about type of sex, frequency of sex, that, you know, reading these things off to like penetrative and oral sex to sixth graders was not appropriate because they're still giggling at the word breast. Um, they're, they're not even sort of there. So this is an example where like the pre-selected tool was not scaled whatsoever for the culture or the age that I was working with. And it was a real problem. So a tool may be a great tool. It may be validated. It may be super scientific and relevant, but is it relevant for the context you're working in? Okay. Um, so I wanna be sure that I stop and take a second to acknowledge that data is political and thus how we collect it is too. And I don't mean political in like a left-wing, right-wing kind of context, but I mean political in terms of the fact that every single choice we make when we collect data influences the type of data we're going to get. And on the other end, what we do with the data is political too. So the idea that data can be neutral or unbiased isn't accurate because like I'm making choices in every single step of the data collection process that makes it not neutral. Um, so I'll give you an example. So I could ask a gender question. What is your gender? Male, female. 
Which of the following best describes your gender identity? Male, female, non-binary, or third gender? Other, while allowing people to actually give me an option there for a write-in. Um, prefer not to say. So like having a write-in box makes the data analysis much more difficult on my side because now I'm actually having to filter through qualitative inputs and under trying to assess what the heck people are talking about. But it makes it a much more inclusive process for other people to be able to describe themselves or to opt out altogether. Like, I don't want to tell you my gender identity. But in both of these, I'm making choices that reflect my values. I'm making choices that maybe reflect the values of my organization or my funder. And it influences the kind of data that I'm going to get. So similarly, even just in a really basic race and ethnicity question, which we're going to ask on a lot of things. What is your race? Which best describes your racial or ethnic identity? Select all that apply. So again, allowing people to select multiple options here makes the data analysis much more difficult for me because it doesn't give me clean percentages that I can easily report. But it also acknowledges that the vast majority of us probably have a complex history with our racial and ethnic identities. Um, similarly, just alphabetizing the list, uh, especially like in a place like Oklahoma, where the vast majority of people who live here and probably would be taking my survey are white, it makes sense to just throw it at the top. Um, but it also describes something about my organization or my values or the things that I say, yeah, this is the go-to. White is the standard, black is the default after that. Whereas like you don't really get that if you just alphabetize the list, nothing's being prioritized. I hope that makes sense. But again, the, the decision to do one or the other is a choice. It's a political choice that's going to influence the data I get, how I analyze the data, how people respond to things. So these are political choices. OK, uh, phase four through six recap. So after you have completed phases four through six, you should be able to answer whether your evaluation questions, design methods, and data collection tools are balancing the needs and requirements of your evaluation with the cultural context of the program or participants while respecting participants and the impact of the evaluation on their safety and future, which I know is a lot of moving pieces. It gets easier the more you do it. All right, phase seven, collecting data. Um, so data collection under CRE emphasizes relationships and people. Uh, those collecting data need to understand not just the technical procedures, but also the cultural context in which they're operating. So like I can design an evaluation, hand the survey to other people and send them out into the world, but they're the ones that are actually interacting with people collecting data. Uh, so it's important that they're versed in the cultural context as well. And the cultural orientation of the evaluation team influences what they can hear, see, and experience. So it's not a bad thing, but we all have filters. We all have lenses. We may miss things like specific word choice or body language. Um, we might be listening for things that we think are pertinent or valuable and miss other things. We might not know when to probe. Um, so being aware of those things can help you interact more efficiently and more effectively in the data collection process. So our practical considerations here. Uh, do partners see their participation as voluntary? And has the purpose of the evaluation and potential benefit been communicated? So sometimes coming into a marginalized community and saying, hi, we just want to ask you a couple of questions. We're collecting some data on a thing is not something they want to help with if they don't understand why you're doing it or what you're trying to collect that data for. Um, similarly, thinking, we say to people all the time, you don't have to participate. But we have to be aware of this is where those power relationships really come to bear. Um, again, that first evaluation job I had with a charitable foundation, they sent me out to go evaluate their programs. I had a list of partners. I scheduled meetings with them and I just picked up the phone and we were going to have an easy interview, right? I was going to ask them a couple of questions. They were going give to us, give us great feedback because we cared about them. We wanted to deliver good programs, except if I'm coming in as an emissary of the foundation who funds their programs, going, hi, we've never met before, but can I ask you a couple of evaluation questions? How honest do you think they were willing to be with me? They don't know me. They don't trust me. They don't trust what I'm going to report back to the people who give them money and allow them to pay their people and run their organizations and impact their community. So what I got was, hi, great. Thanks for calling. Everything's wonderful. Please give us more money. Over and over. It's just toxic positivity at Newsom. And I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. 
Because I'm like, I don't know, I worked really hard on my evaluation questions, but it had nothing to do with that. They didn't feel, one, that they're, they were able to participate voluntarily, and two, that they could be honest, because I wasn't aware of the power that I brought as an employee of the foundation. Um, similarly, have you allowed enough time for introductions and grounding? I did not in that instance. I just came right in and started asking them questions. And do you have a plan if data collection is harmful in the moment? Um, sometimes we're working with programs that can be really challenging or triggering or experiences that were negative, especially if we're doing things like public health programming or community-based programming. And I've absolutely been doing like interviews or focus groups and people are not okay. And I have to balance the fact that I need this information to conduct this evaluation with the fact that the person in front of me, the very real human being is not okay in the moment. Um, so just having a backup plan, if you're working on information or programming that can be triggering or harmful, like how are you gonna navigate that with people? Phase eight, as we analyze our data. So again, understanding that cultural context is imperative for accurate data collection. We collect data in a cultural context. People answer things in a cultural context. They provide us information from their own cultural standing. So if we're not aware of that, how are we supposed to accurately analyze it? Um, and holding really carefully that those of us who analyze data are giving voice and meaning to the data itself. So we are, in a lot of ways, the voice for people who trust us with the knowledge and feedback that they're giving us because we're taking their experience, giving it voice, giving it meaning, and then disseminating it out to people who probably have more power than the people who gave us feedback. So holding in that, that is political. We're making choices. Are we aware of the choices and the ramifications of giving that data meaning and voice? So some practical considerations here. Uh, would your data analysis be better if you had a cultural interpreter or a partner review panel? Again, sometimes I just pick up the phone and run stuff by my educators completely informally. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big formal process, but it allows you to just be sure that as you're analyzing, you're keeping that culture grounded and at the forefront. Um, it's important that we're also examining outliers and unexpected findings carefully. So good data science would tell us that when you're looking at things, you should have a, a statistically valid or reliable amount of responses for something to be relevant, right? But in culturally responsive evaluation, we might only have one black participant or one gay participant or one person who is disabled. So their experience isn't statistically valid, but they're the only people who had that experience. And it's important that we're looking at them and we're thinking about those individual and outlier pieces of feedback. Um, because we want to hold that the program may not be received by everyone in the same way. So thinking back earlier this week to some of our accessibility stuff that we saw, if somebody can't hear or can't access the stage to give a presentation, or they can't stand long enough to get lunch because they have mobility challenges, they may be the only person reporting that, but it's still really important that we're aware of those things. And again, as you analyze, have you reflected on how the culture of the evaluator or the evaluation team is shaping the conclusions that we're coming to, especially what info is given the most or the least weight? Um, I can totally say as somebody who's an internal evaluator, when I work with Cheryl to evaluate a program, I'm not just evaluating that program in a vacuum. I'm bringing with it all of my cultural understanding of how OSU Extension works, the jobs of our extension educators or our state faculty, and like past evaluation results. So I'm 100% letting those experiences influence the way I evaluate programs and the data I look at currently. So sometimes I have to stop and say to myself, is this conclusion actually coming from the data in front of me or is it coming from my past experience with this cultural context? Okay, so our last phase, phase nine. Uh, CRE, when it's done well, increases the truthfulness and the utility of evaluation results because we're actually digging below the surface and we're getting to something more relevant to people's lived experience. And those lived experiences actually can make for results that have more impact when we go to inform our programs. Um, again, CRE prioritizes that social betterment. So we want to be thinking about now I have these evaluation results. How can I use them to promote equity? It doesn't have, I mean, you don't have to change society, but in your own little spheres of influence, how can you create more equity and more social betterment with the data you have? We want to move from evidence to, okay, we collected it, it's in a report, it's sitting on a shelf somewhere, to that advocacy and action piece. 
Um, Cheryl knows how hard I push for things sometimes up here because it's like, no, somebody shared this with me and it's important and I'm going to keep pushing until something budges. And that's oftentimes way outside the purview of a traditional evaluation specialist, but it's the commitment that I bring to my work as a CRE specialist. So some of your practical considerations that you want to be aware of at this stage, uh, thinking through who owns findings and data. If you do work with a community and they tell you that they don't want something reported or they don't want something shared or they don't want something published, how are you going to handle that? You collected it, but you're also reporting on their experience. So who owns that data? Um, who benefits and who's potentially harmed from the results that you have? So the example I used earlier with our internal online programming, um, I had to ask myself, should I report that less than 50% of people internally are using these programs because that could have an impact on my colleague who's our instructional designer because that is her program. Uh, somebody could use that to justify thinking we don't actually need to spend all this money on this thing. What can be elevated to create change? Change for whom? And what should potentially be held back? Uh, and what is the best way to communicate results with different partners? So the results that you might communicate in a report for a funder might not necessarily be the same that you give back to the community and say, hey, here's something for your own use. Okay, so our phase seven through nine recap. At the end of those phases, you should uh, know whether participants are aware of their rights and data collection and is the evaluation team responding to cultural considerations and issues of power? Have, do you have cultural understanding or representatives to help you analyze data? And are you analyzing data for different impacts on different groups, especially considering those outliers? And have you considered issues of ownership, inclusion, impact, and how to create meaningful change as you disseminate results? So some final thoughts if you're like, okay, that was way too much and I'm not gonna be able to hold all of that. Here's some basic things to remember about CRE. CRE centers people, culture, and lived experience and evaluation along with our needs and goals. So the two things do not conflict. They are weaved together in a CRE evaluation. CRE's fundamental goal is social justice, increasing equity, and changing society. Um, and those of you who've maybe painfully done an evaluation or done it because somebody told you to, I know that maybe sounds like a big goal, but I fundamentally do this work because I actually believe evaluation can change society. Um, CRE is integrated at every phase of the evaluation process. It isn't an add-on to the evaluation. It is a change in how we think about evaluation and how we actually do evaluation. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, if any of that sounded cool, or even if you just want to talk more, we should be friends. Uh, here's my contact. I'm sure they'll put it in the chat too. Um, and then, Emily, what questions do we have? Scarlett, thank you. That was such an expansive and well-structured um, presentation. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, we have a bunch of questions, so I'm going to start. The first question um, is, uh, I'm just going to read the question. When should an evaluator use CRE? It takes a lot of time, as you mentioned, um, to do it. It also requires a certain skill level. This is the first question to think about um, on the culture and the program implementation outcomes. Yeah, so my answer to that is if culture, equity, social justice matters to you, then we should be doing some level of CRE in all of our evaluation efforts. Um, it can take a lot of time. I don't think it necessarily has to. Uh, one of the things that they're going to link you guys as a resource is a culturally responsive evaluation checklist that you can burn through really quickly. Um, and it also, it gets easier and you'll get faster at it. I mean, this is fundamentally a way that I think. So I'm not sitting there going, okay, like I've thought about the evaluation, now I have to CRE. It becomes reflexive. Um, and it becomes reflexive in thinking through not only CRE, but like the way you engage the whole world. Um, okay, Emily. Thank you. The next question, what are some examples of nonverbal communication as it relates to data tools? Oh, Vikram, you're one of my favorite humans. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I said, uh, nonverbal communication can be things like the branding of your tools, of your organization, reputation. Um, I'm going to be doing a presentation at the American Evaluation Association in October on um, embodiment uh, and uh, embodiment as a methodology for evaluation. So a lot of times science has painted the things that we know from here down and the things that we know from here up to be two separate things. 
but a lot of us have a lot of knowledge and understanding about the world that is embedded in our bodies. Um, one of my favorite examples for this is if I say to you, like, how do you hold a baby? Most of us can, you know, make some arm motion. Yeah, Emily, like it's immediate, right? You don't necessarily think about it, though. You just kind of have this embodied body, like body knowledge of how that works. Um, so I'm going to be doing a presentation on thinking through how you pay attention to what people are saying, but also what their bodies are doing, what your body is doing, how bodies exist in space and time. Um, that, yeah, is, um, is, is impactful for deeper evaluation results. That sounds like an amazing presentation. Uh, we have another question from Vikram. Uh, what do you think of using not listed instead of other for gender? Um, that's a good question. I, if you're not doing a write-in box, um, I'm not sure if it necessarily matters. Um, my gut instinct is that not listed almost feels like telling on ourselves. Um, like we don't have an option for you and it's not in the list, uh, versus like, here's a list of options. Are you somewhere that's not in this list? Um, not listed almost feels like saying we could have listed it, but we chose not to. Um, but uh, you know, had a caveat with a, with a written box. So if there's not listed with a written box too, he just posted that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, not listed. Yeah, that would work if you were inviting people to share it with you. Um, you know, I totally recognize that potentially my approach to feeling like mm, not listed doesn't feel as sensitive as I'd like. It potentially is coming from a gendered place because um, not listed also feels kind of masculine to me. I don't know if anybody else is getting that vibe. Um, so, yeah, I think either way. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Timothy Hicks has a question. Uh, are there software, software or software tools, um, tools in general to allow you to input a question and evaluate real time how inclusive or exclusive the question is phrased? Um, so I don't believe so, Timothy, um, only because I'm not really sure how a piece of software like that would work, given that the question's responsiveness is related to your context. Um, so unless you were telling the software, like, is this question responsive for women or for LGBT populations or things like that, the software wouldn't know that. Um, you could probably give it a shot with AI and see what it says. Uh, I will say, though, that some AI is like ChatGBT was trained on a lot of Reddit communications, and they had to work really, really hard to get it to not be uh, so racist because a lot of the data it was given was. Um, but you could probably play with that. Uh, my go-to with something like that is always just to find somebody who, like, is a member of that culture who understands that context and run it past them. Um, and believe it or not, showing that humility of being like, "Hey, this is not my area of expertise. Can you run, can you look at these questions?" Uh, can be a really important bridge builder in the evaluation process too. All right, thank you so much. Um, this is a little bit longer of a question. I'm going to read it as it was posed. Mm -hmm. um, so, quote, I noticed you listed white in your evaluation. Why did you decide to use white instead of Caucasian? Do you add that result to the white percentage if someone entered Caucasian in the free text box? What about mixed races? Um, what way do you show two or more races and percentages? For example, would Native American and African American be in the same category as Native American and Caucasian American? Um, end quote on that question. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I tend to keep it simple. Um, you know, Caucasian as a terminology refers to the Caucasus region of Europe. Um, and a lot of white people don't specifically know where their European ancestry is from, or it's certainly not from the Caucasus region. Uh, but almost everybody can vibe with white. Um, you could do a white slash Caucasian. Um, oh, Emily, dang, I was, wait, okay. <laughs> you bopped the question off and there were yeah, several pieces can... in there. That's okay. Um, I get it back. I don't know. You know, I, I do. Well, I think I could go to answer it if I wanted to. Yeah, um, I also do percent. like black slash African-American because a lot of black people will be like, well, I've never lived in Africa. Um, so I tend to follow the uh, APA and MLA style guidelines when I write race and ethnicity, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so a lot of times if you offer somebody that open ended box, I have no idea why, but they will write in things that are already in the list. 
and I just add those. So if somebody wrote in Caucasian, I would add it to white because it makes sense. Um, for the other things, I would probably have a separate box that would be two or more. And then under the two or more heading, um, I would report any substantial, like if I had two or more and, you know, it was 30% of the people who answered two or more are Black and uh, Native American, I would report that underneath two or more 30%. You know, and I, I also kind of, the guidance I use on that is also what I know about the population that's answering. Um, so if I am going into like a Creole community and I'm expecting a large two or more percentage, I'm expecting to do those things. But I would not add the two or more into the black or so I would have people who answered one, people who answered two or more and report those as separate. OK, this question is related. We have been using enter your own instead of other to avoid othering the person's mm -hmm. identity. That's a further earlier question, um, a comment rather. OK, another question. Wouldn't holding back information from dad from, you know, holding back information be against evaluation ethics? So I think you mentioned mm -hmm. um, when and when when and how to share data earlier with different folks. Yeah, so that that is a, a tough one that kind of boils down to this fundamental question of who does the evaluator work for. Um, if you largely believe that you only work for the people who sign your paycheck, then yeah, we could say that might be against evaluation ethics because they're paying for this information. If you hold that there's more complexity in that and maybe you work for the communities that you're working with or that you represent as well as the people who sign your paycheck and you're balancing those things, um, a lot of like indigenous methodologies will say hands down if you're working with tribal groups, they own the data, they decide what gets put forward. And that might be something that you work into a contract or you talk to a funder about upfront like hey you want to go collect this data best practices with indigenous groups is that they own their data because historically they've not been allowed to own nearly anything. And this is a really important piece of working with these people. Um, so you can kind of negotiate that up front. Also hold back doesn't always necessarily mean exclude completely. Sometimes it means package differently or deliver differently. Um, there might be things where if I give a presentation on the results, I might include something in the spoken presentation that isn't included in the slides or in the written report because I want something to be subject to um, a conversation but not necessarily live on paper in the same way. Um, something I get here at extension is like, oh, well, who said that? Because we want to be able to follow up with them. And in that instance, I might say, let me go talk to that person and see if they would like to be followed up with. Do they feel safe or comfortable enough for you to reach out to them? Um, but I've absolutely told my administration, like, I'm sorry, I can't give you that information because this person doesn't want me to. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's a negative evaluation ethic because it's part of the agreement I had with that person. Um, when I asked them for data, as they said, well, can you make sure that no one finds out I said this? And if they say that up front and I agree to it, then I hold that responsibility is really important. There was a second piece to that, right, Emily? Or a first piece? Um, no, that was great. We do have one final question, or actually a few more populated, but I think we only have time for one more. Um, and it's um, kind of, we're almost out of time. So how long has CRE been around? How long do you think it will take for it to be the standard rather than the exception? Funders have specific questions that are not CRE friendly. So it mm -hmm. seems pretty difficult to put CRE in practice. Our, that's our final question. Yeah, um, so CRE uh, has had a couple of different names. It's been around for a few decades. I mean, the evaluation field is relatively new in of itself, but pretty much as soon as somebody codified that this is a real thing, uh, we also codified that we should be considerate. Um, so Stafford Hood, Rodney Hobson, Karen Kirkhart, these are kind of the thought leaders in this field. Um, and they're all still alive. There are people you can call. Uh, my, my very earliest evaluation thought leaders are kind of starting to get into their 80s and 90s. So we are a relatively new field. Um, as far as the funder specific questions, I consider it one of my jobs as an evaluator who has the cultural cachet of being a well-educated white woman who understands this better than the funders or the project partners to be willing to go to funders and be like, hey, I have some concerns about the responsiveness or the relevancy of these questions for the particular populations we're working with. Is there any wiggle room here? And sometimes there's not, but sometimes funders are like, yeah, I don't know, that's what we used last time or we pulled it out of a hat or we did a Google search. Having worked for a charitable foundation, I'm going to give you guys the 101 here, you would be amazed how often funders also are working by the seat of their pants. So don't ever be afraid to just ask. 
can we edit this? Can we alter this? Is there something, you know, and, and be willing to say, hey, if this is something all of the projects are using, can we get together and maybe change these questions to be more responsive for everybody? Um, but don't be afraid to ask. It doesn't hurt. You might get told no, um, but just because they hand down something doesn't necessarily mean you have to take it. Uh, I'm also a rebel rouser, though, so... Are you sure you don't want to go in with a lot? We just have one question. Go ahead, Emily. Let's go ahead and do the last okay, one. Uh, yeah, it's a good one. I feel like okay. it's really good. How do you deal with survey exhaustion with participants when you have to host a long survey session or after a long event? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so, so a couple of tips for that one. Um, thinking critically about are all of the questions I'm asking on this survey something that needs to be asked after the, we call it the intervention and evaluation, but like after the program? A lot of questions that I look at on surveys are things you could ask on a registration form because they don't necessarily, they're not dependent on people having received the program. So can you bump some of those things and move them a place? Uh, do you have a section at the end that's like a reflection or an addition or isn't necessarily imperative to the educational thing you're offering where you're trying to change something? And so could you have the survey three quarters of the way through. Um, also just thinking about, you know, does somebody have to have a piece of paper and a pencil for this? Or can you, you know, what I do with my educators a lot is just say, tape some questions to the wall and put some buckets and hand them a rock, right? Um, and, you know, that's people are getting up, they're moving, they're reading the questions, they're, you know, playing pin the tail on the donkey, right? Where you give somebody a sticker and there's like columns of questions. With stuff like that, you wanna be aware of like, uh, like social pressure, uh, like peer pressure. Um, so if you're putting the rocks in the bucket and people are like, oh no, I don't know, everybody's answering the first one and I wasn't going to answer that, but I don't want to look. So, you know, you might cover the buckets, right? So they can't see the sticker one. People can see them adding up. Um, if you have a group that's like mobile and you can tell that you're losing them, having people stand up and be like, okay, so we're going to split the room. If you agree with this, or if you feel this way, move to the left side or move to the right side. And then you can have a little bit of a conversation. Like, why are you guys on the left side? Why are you guys on the right side? Um, it's still a survey question. And as long as you count how many participants are there and like how many participants answered the left side of the room and the right side of the room, it's still basic statistics, but you're getting people up and you're moving, you're engaging different parts of their brain. So get creative with it. I hope that helped. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's wrap up for today. Thank you so much, Scarlett, for all the information that you shared and also to Tia and Emily, our facilitators who helped today behind the scenes. We appreciate you very much. Um, it's exciting to be wrapping up today's uh, our virtual summer school for the week.